sleepy last session of the, uh, or last afternoon of the conference crowd. So we're hoping to pump up the volume, perhaps to 11. And uh, we will get going here today on storytelling, which I'm very passionate about. Um, I typically start my presentations with a discussion of my underwear, so today will be no different. Um, when I spoke in Las Vegas, I was having huge bra strap issues, so that's kind of where I went with that. Today, I was a little worried about getting here on time because I was trapped in my Spanx in the upstairs bathroom. <laughs> so I think that I have solved that now. I went, I'm not going to breathe, I'm not going to drink any more water, and I think we'll be ready to go. So again, my name is Cindy Reed. I am a writer. I walk a lot, so I guess I can't do that today. Um, I'm a writer. Let's see, writer, blogger, speech, speaker, teacher. I have been teaching writing since um, the Cold War, and I hope that I can impart some of that value to you guys today. What I am most passionate about is teaching bloggers how to write stories to engage their readers. There's actually some really cool science behind this. Thomas Dolby Science. I always want to shout out science, and then at some cause nobody knows what I'm talking about. So anyway, Princeton did a study a few years back where they did, um, they used, you know, electrodes or whatever, and they synced up the brains of people telling stories and people listening to stories. And a really remarkable thing happened. As the teller was relating the story, the same parts of the listener's brain were lighting up. Memory, language, sensory perception, um, you know, visuals and experiences. It's a really powerful thing when the brains actually synchronize. Like if you had little Doppler radars of the brains, the same colors would be going on in the two parts. So that's the kind of power that you want to bring to your blog. You want your readers to have that same engagement. When you can synchronize the brains of you and your readers, that is pretty amazing. So why? What's going to happen if you tell stories and engage people? People are going to stay. You're going to have more time on page. People are going to dig through your archives. They want to look and find out more about you. They are going to share your stuff with your, their friends, and then they will tell their friends, and so on, and so on. And they're going to return, because now you're a human. You're an actual, literal person, and not just some company or some individual giving instructions behind the ether of the, the series of tubes that make up our internet. Story is also persuasive. I mean, you can't swing a dead cat on Copyblogger or Content Marketing Institute without someone writing about branding using storytelling. So for your business, again, so you're not anonymous like everybody else. You stand out by creating your uh, personal brand story, and that sells. So what do I mean by story? I'm not talking about fairy tales, once upon a time, this happened, war and peace. We are talking about creative nonfiction storytelling. And the story equation, when we do creative nonfiction, we're borrowing the best elements of fiction and bringing it into our nonfiction writing so that it reads like fiction. The elements are, and this could be like a whole entire, I'm pointing at my screen because this whole TED Talk thing is really new to me. I've, <laughs> I've never spoken with the uh, screens that I can't point at. Um, so this whole equation, conflict plus narrative structure, is like a year-long course in writing, and we're going to do it in 29 minutes. So we're going to talk about conflict first. The story has to have stuff happening that's interesting. Conflict is not, you know, boxing. It's not people <laughs> fighting. It's something happening, an experience happening, people changing. It could be an internal struggle. It could just be tension in an entertaining thing that happened to you. But it has to matter to you, and it has to matter to the reader. The best way for me to teach about what conflict is is to tell you what it isn't. Because without conflict, you have no story. So story is much more than just an emotion or an idea. That's a diary. That's your artist way pages that you write in the morning. And those things have value. They have value to you personally. I mean, psychology studies have shown that that helps to calm people, almost like meditation. But it's not a story if you post it on your blog. It may have value, but it's not the sort of thing that's going to engage other people. So I was sad or angry or elated. It's not a story. Here's an example. Gardening is peaceful. I like gardening. I hate gardening. That's just a, an emotion. That's how you feel about gardening. But you need to turn it into a story in order for it to engage. So here's an, the opposite. 
As my life spiraled into chaos, I tended my garden, the one constant keeping my soul intact. That leads you to a lot more experiences. That allows for transformation of character, of emotions, and for action to happen. Story is more than a sales pitch. How many people here have business blogs or blogs that they hope to sell things off of? Yes. So, and I'm gonna pick on web designers here. I know there's probably a lot of web designers here, but what I find when I go to web designer sites is that they all look the same. You know, use our services because these are the gold standard, these are the things we do, there's bullet points, there's an about us page, but they all look the same. Again, if your website looks the same as other people, you're not memorable. You are anonymous and you, they're not gonna remember to come back to you. But if you use your sales page to tell stories, then you become a real human being, somebody they want to work with. So here, Etsy, Etsy scarves. Buy my scarves on Etsy because they're awesome and I am one of one zillion people knitting scarves and hawking them on Etsy. <laughs> are you gonna remember that person? You know, I have awesome scarves. Or are you gonna come to the site that talks about why she knits or he? I perched on a rickety stool, memorizing the way my grandmother's leathered hands scraped the wool between the carding boards. Now you're into her motivation, her experiences. There's room for you to learn more about her and her knitting. I really should say he or she on knitting. Knitting is like a huge thing. I, I'm from Asheville, like everyone is knitting everywhere in Asheville. <laughs> Um, story is also not simply reporting facts. And again, there's a place for all these things. There's the police blotter. You just want facts. You don't need a story about, you know, the burglar's back history necessarily. So chronologies, straight reporting, and instructions. All not stories because there's no conflict. I tend to see this most um, travel bloggers and DIY bloggers. Travel bloggers will give you an itinerary. Here we went, here's some cool pictures. Here we went next. Dinner was good, I felt good about the dinner, you know, whatever. Or you get DIY blogs where it's a step-by-step -step tutorial. There are so many stories. On a travel blogging thing, you could break that down into 30 posts. And we all know that our blogs are content hungry. So why have just one straight itinerary when you could have a series? You could even put a menu tab, you know, trip to, I was speaking to someone yesterday who went to Portland and had an awesome, um, trip out there and wrote about it. You could have that as a special tab. So when people come to your site, you're the expert on Portland and you have all these engaging stories to tell about it. So, what is not conflict? Evan's sixth birthday party. Yay, it's a happy birthday party. Everybody came, they were excited for Evan's sixth birthday party. We had games, we had awesome cake, everybody get a goodie bag and they left and everybody was happy. Nothing happened. <laughs> it's not a story. Don't be Evan's birthday party. And again, I see this in parenting blogs, often people who want to put in a lot of affiliate links to the goodie bag materials, the caterer, you know, all the things that happened. People, you know, they're going to be bored by just reading about a straight um, chronology of what happened. So if you make it an interesting story, if there was some tension, did Evan throw up? Did you suddenly feel nostalgic about when Evan was a baby and this was a transformation for you as a parent, kind of a rite of passage? Lots of things could have been in there to create that tension and conflict, but it, it, it's just not gonna be interesting unless you do that. So, that is what is conflict and what is not conflict. So how do we tell these stories on our blog? Well, you see studies of what people actually read or those heat maps of where their eyes go on a blog. You don't have a lot of time. You want to tell your story in a flash. About 500 words is a good blog sized post. It's called flash nonfiction and it's what I specialize in. It is not telling your story quickly. It is not taking that trip to Portland, jamming it into 500 words and you know getting everything out like that. It is telling instead a story with one core concept at a time, breaking down that trip into components so you can tell stories that will fill your blog for perhaps a few weeks. So you edit until your story is blog-sized. It's like fun-sized. It's like the Snickers bag you buy and then eat before Halloween and then you have to buy it again and hide it from your children. So it's about 400 to 600 words. How do you find the one core concept? 
Let's break it down. Again, Cindy, with the Etsy scarves. Here they are. We're going to break down these Etsy scarves into a bunch of stories that the seller could talk about. I've done three categories here, wool, dyes, and knitting. And remember, this person lives in Asheville. How many people have been to Asheville or know about it? Yeah, <laughs> OK. So you know, you know my people. All right, so the wool. She probably sheared the sheep that lived in her backyard and ate the organic grain that she grew. And she can talk about the sheep and their personalities and what it was like, the shearing process. She can also tell that story I mentioned before about the grandma teaching her all about wool and all about knitting. The dyes, because she lives in Asheville, she harvests them, you know, ecologically or environmentally, environmentally sustainably. Um, she has learned which berries to use, perhaps from her personal shaman. And she harvests the berries on hikes in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains. Finally, knitting as a process. How does she choose her patterns? Is she inspired by art, by the colors in a garden? All of those things are stories of places she went and what happened on those trips and how it inspired her as an artist. And finally, the process of knitting as mindful meditation. So many possible posts from that particular store. So conflict, we're telling it in a flash. The second part of that story equation, remember conflict plus narrative structure. Here we are in narrative structure. Story requires structure. What you want to avoid is what I call, I hope my dad never watches this if it's videoed, what I call the, the so I says to the guy I says kind of story. <laughs> if you were ever captive at the dinner table in my house, you heard many of these. And he was a salesman, so there was a lot of stories about sell, selling welding supplies where he started out. So I says to the guy I says. That is not a story. That's how we talk. We do a lot of you know, vocal tics, we go on tangents, we are boring on occasion. What story is, is narrative. And what narrative means is that we have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But Cindy, I can't do that in 500 words. You know, that like, takes a lot more time. But remember, we're doing it in one core concept at a time. So you can do it. Here's the beginning. One way that you edit out words is by starting when your story starts. And what I mean by that is don't go all the way back in time to set it up with exposition and backstory. You can do that if you're writing a play or writing a novel. Even then, it's kind of boring to do it. It's better to weave it in. You want to start exactly when your story starts. So you don't have that paragraph of introduction either. This is a Toastmasters. We're not going to tell them what we're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what we told them. We're just going to tell them. And actually, we're just going to show them when I get, you know, show, don't tell. So then what I like personally is a short first paragraph, a short first sentence. That's my style. Your style may be different. What you want is any kind of narrative hook. The first sentence grabs them, and the only purpose of the first sentence is to make them read the second sentence and so on, onto your blog. There's lots of ways to create a great narrative hook that will engage your reader. A line of dialogue is a great way. Some interesting or unusual bit about the setting where it takes place, where it makes people curious what's going to happen there. An unusual fact that's sort of mysterious that makes you want to know why that happened. A very good example of that is from The Glass Castle, which is Jeanette Wall's memoir. Has anybody read it? Yeah, amazing, amazing book. So this is the very first sentence of her memoir. I was sitting in a taxi, wondering if I had overdressed for the evening, when I looked out the window and saw Mom rooting through the dumpster. Lots of things that you want to know about that sentence. They're, they're living these parallel lives in different classes. How did that happen? It's almost like she didn't expect her mom to be in the same city. Like, what has happened in their relationship and in their lives to send them in these different directions, where mom is dumpster diving, and she's apparently in a cab off to some kind of elegant evening. It's a great first sentence. You want it to be punchy. That's the narrative hook. Um, this is an, an example of something I wrote. I didn't write the wordy one. I wrote the punchy one, OK, just so you know. <laughs> I went back and I wrote bad for you guys. So I spoke at a conference that was literally called Bacon in Las Vegas. It was like the best conference name ever, boarding area conference. It was for travel bloggers. So I could have started at the beginning of time. I was flying from Asheville to Las Vegas. I connected through Atlanta. 
on my way to speak at a conference that was literally called Bacon. Or the story I wrote was called The Exit Row. It's a story where I was so anxious about sitting in the en exit row that, you know, because you have to like lift that thing and turn it and like toss it out. The whole plane's depending on you that I nearly soiled myself out of fear. <laughs> so the whole story's about the exit row. So you start there. I dropped into the window seat on the wing, the exit row. That's a punchy start. Look, we wrote the beginning. We're on to the middle. The middle, I like to call it the muddle in the middle. This is where everything happens. It's the hardest to organize. It's the hardest to edit because you think everything's so important. But you want to do a couple things. If you've ever taken a theater class or a fiction class, you know the typical plot chart. You know, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. The middle is the rising action. These are the obstacles that you need to overcome. How did you clean up Evan's vomit while still trying to entertain the other children with juggling? You know, that's one way that you have it. I wrote a post this fall called Apple Hell, a fun fall family tradition. And so the conflict there was me against the orchard against the 102 degree weather. And it was going to be a fun thing. I was going to take my elementary age daughters and we were, we were going to pick apples like every other person in the Appalachian Mountains. But it was a horrible day, and um, we uh, ended up having a lot of obstacles in our path to successfully bring those apples home, which everybody hated at the end of the day, because nobody really likes apples anyway. So that's one way. You can show all the obstacles. You can show characters changing and growing, characters transforming. That's the thing when I mentioned about Evan's parents. Maybe, you know, let's say it was an 18th birthday. That's kind of you're going into that empty nest thing. That is a transformation in character. That is also rising action and tension. So you want to create that tension to keep the reader going until you reach the climax. The other key to making the middle interesting is to show, don't tell. Writing teacher's favorite adage, show, don't tell. Well, what does show, don't tell really mean? Mark Twain, one of my favorites, don't say the old lady screamed bring her on and let her scream. So how do we bring her on and show her screaming? What is she screaming about? Is she surprised? Is she angry? Um, is she, why else do people scream? Is she upset? Is she, you know, horrified about something? Scared? Lots of reasons. And you show that by showing her behavior. Maybe her hair is disheveled. You show the setting that's happening around her. You could describe her clothing. And you also show the reactions and dialogue of other characters who are in the room. All of that is so much more interesting than just saying that she screamed. That's telling. Here's a couple of examples. This is one of my examples um, called Crowded Taekwondo. Um, so this is about the time I had a hot flash in my daughter's Taekwondo class. Women of a certain age, am I right? It just happens sometimes, and you're like so schwitzy that you have to do something about it. What happened at this was really unfortunate because I had this favorite Target, it's a snap-up um, flannel shirt, and usually I wear a t-shirt under it, it's like so hot, I just ripped open the snaps, but unfortunately that day I had not worn the t-shirt, oh, so thereby flashing the entire dojang, or whatever they call it. So. How I started the story was with a little bit of showing about the setting. I could have told people it was crowded at my daughter's Taekwondo class. You know what it feels like to be crowded, you know, whatever. But I showed instead. The backside of a backpack dad poked into me uncomfortably adjacent to my face. Like you're feeling like you're gonna have a hot flush right now, right? So you know, you know you have a lot more feeling of claustrophobia. Here's another one from my friend Louise Duca. She's a beautiful writer. She could have just said, my grandma gave me her old car. But look what she does. She shows using character development. She was wide-hipped and thirsty, and I called her Bertha after the Grateful Dead song. A two-tone 72 Cutlass handed down from my grandma. She's turned that car into a character into her in her story. Now we're at the end. Now we're at the end. OK, so in life, what we want is peace and serenity. That's why there's so many yoga studios. We want to be centered. We want to you know, get away from all the stress. But in stories, once you reach that point of equilibrium, your story's over. You're done. So when equilibrium is achieved, 
Stop telling your story. Do not be tempted to do these three things. <laughs> I feel like I should, to show both the screens, I feel like I need to do that. Know when to stop. The first one I'm going to do is the one on the um, no summing up, because that goes back to our Toastmasters thing. You don't need to have a summary paragraph telling everybody what you just told them. They read it. If you wrote it well, they know what you told them, what you've shown them, how you've made them feel, the mood and the tone of the story, how it will linger in their minds. It's not story. It's something that can be edited out to get you to your 500 words. No neat bows on the other side. This is something I see in parenting blogs a lot. So say you're writing a story about a really horrible day with your kids. I mean, imagine that. <laughs> a horrible day with your kids. Like apple picking, for example. Suppose that, you know, you were out and you were in the minivan. Well, the kids got sick. They were arguing. It was a terrible day. You were exhausted. It was relentless. And you're telling a story about this. But then the writer gets to the end and thinks, everyone's going to think I'm a horrible parent and I hate my children. And so they don't trust the reader to understand the story that they've told. It's a hard day. You know, parenting is hard, but I still love my kids. So they write something like this. And that's why motherhood is the hardest job I'll ever live. It's so inauthentic. I mean, you basically negated the entire awesome story that you've told, the real story that you've told, the Irma Bombeck version of parenting, which is amazing. And you've made it something that's less authentic. Um, so don't do that. Don't tie everything up in a neat bow. Like I was saying before, the stories that linger the most in our minds maybe have a little bit of an open ending. Maybe we wonder what happened next or what, how they felt next. Trust your reader to kind of figure that out or to apply it to their own life. That's what good writing is about. It's a dialogue between the reader and the writer. And finally, no navel gazing. What that is is telling the readers what the story meant to you the writer. And I have an example of that. This is a bad example of my writing. So I was in an accident, um, and it was traumatic. And I had my daughter in the back seat, and so, oh, someone was actually thrown against our car. So this isn't a funny story. <laughs> and um, so my daughter was in the back seat, so I pulled over and I stopped. But I was afraid to help, because I was more worried about her. So I wrote the post about it, and at the end, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not funny, it's not a funny story, but this is such a horrible paragraph. At the end, I stopped and I thought, should I have done more? Aren't we defined by the choices we make in the blink of an eye? <laughs> it's just like it's so overwrought. It's not story, it's me telling you how I feel about the incident that happened. So I actually cheated and like a year later, I went in and added this other ending to it. I left this one in because, you know, I'm not Stalin. I'm not erasing the past. So that line is still in there. But I went back and I wrote this other line that said, when the local news called today, I declined to be interviewed on camera. That story, that ended the story. And then I trust you to figure out how I felt. Or you can think about whether my choices were right or wrong or how you might have behaved in that situation. Follow the Coco Chanel rule. This is my last rule about endings of your story. If you know Coco Chanel, she was a designer. She was usually draped in um, ropes and ropes of necklaces. And her famous line is, when accessorizing, always take off the last thing you put on. So when you go back, look at the end of your story and think, eh, is that story or am I adding something on? Am I navel gazing? Am I putting in a neat bow? Or am I summing up? And lop that off. Now, for Coco Chanel, I mean, she had so much jewelry on in all of her pictures, I like, can't imagine what the pre-exit Coco <laughs> Chanel must have looked like. I mean, like, maybe she had like, a like, little pinky ring that she removed. You know? But anyway, that's her, fav her famous adage, and I want you to follow that and, and ignore the reality of who Coco Chanel was and what she wore. Number one question I get as a writing instructor, how do I find my voice? What is my authentic voice? First of all, let's define what voice is. Voice is making your story sound like you and making your story sound like what's in your head, which is a much harder thing to do. We all have great stuff. Like when I'm driving in the car, I, I could write like the, the best blog post ever, and then I get home and I'm like, mm, 
this? You know, like what words was I having? It sounds so much better in your head. So really the art of finding your voice is getting that on paper the way that you want it. Everybody says write like you talk. Um, again, you want to avoid the so I says to the guy I says. Don't write like you talk because we don't talk in tight little narratives. All right? Write like you are. Discover who you are as a person and then you'll find your voice. So how do you discover your voice? It's like it's hiding somewhere. It's like, where is it? Is it under the table? Is it behind the ottoman where my three-year-old hides every time and is always surprised that I find them there? Is my voice over there? Um, you can look at a couple things to help you figure out what your voice is. First of all, your personality. Are you a formal person? Are you sarcastic? Are you a very centered person? All of those things contribute to the way that you experience the world and the language that you use. How do you speak? I speak really quickly. <laughs> I, um, I, you, maybe you speak um, in proper English. Maybe you have a regional dialect. Maybe you use a lot of slang. So you want to bring those things in. And grammar is important, but it's not always important. If you speak in slang or a regional dialect, you want to use that. That's who you are. That's your voice. I'm originally from Minnesota, where we say things like, OK, so you bring home cookies, and you say, oh, are those store-bought cookies? Because they were cookies that were purchased at the store as opposed to homemade. So store-bought is not grammatically correct, but it's what we say. So if I was telling the story about my childhood, I would say store-bought cookies, um, or whatever your regional dialect might be. Think about how your mind works. My mind races. <laughs> races. So I tend to, in my stories, make a lot of connections to different places and then hopefully tie it all together at the end. If you are a more logical thinker, your stories may, will typically have a more linear fashion. You may tell them more slowly. Your core concepts may be narrower than my core concepts where I want to you know, make all these different connections. You also want to think about your focus. The things that are the building blocks of story are really plot, dialogue, character, and setting. So what do you remember when you go to an event? Suppose you went to WordCamp and you get home. Do you remember the things that happened, the events, the action? Do you remember your conversations with people and what they were like, what was their essence? Or do you remember what people wore? I always remember what people wore. Or you know the setting that you were in, describing the room, how it was like at the bar last night. All of those things are going to affect the balance of information that you include in your story. If you are plot driven, you're Stephen King. You're Xing out everything that is not plot, driving your plot forward. If you are someone who um, likes character and dialogue, that's what I tend to think in is dialogue, you're going to have more of a balance towards that. I mean, you always need plot. You always need all of these things, but it's a different balance depending on where your focus is. Here's a couple of examples of voice. I have an informal voice. This is from my blog, The Reedster Speaks. This is Apple Hell. Okay, so here's this. We stood in line behind all of America. This was in what I call the, sh the, um, the checkout barn of sorrow. <laughs> a woman dripping with perspiration and toddlers learned the hard way that the archer only took cash. A man towed a radio flyer wagon overflowing with apples. The Duggars couldn't have eaten that many apples in a lifetime. Here's my friend Bill Dameron, a lyrical voice. It's lovely writing. I could never write this way. It's not my personality, but he actually thinks in imagery. This is when he first said, I love you, to his partner, now husband. When we drive along the rocky coast of Maine and watch the green ocean swell, like it is a living being larger than eternity, I do not say it. He doesn't say he loves him. It's a beautiful post. And finally, Michelle Longo, another excellent blogger. She's got a very minimalist voice. She's not Hemingway. You know, she's not only using words that have three and four letters, but it's much more minimalist than a lot of other writers. Here's one about the summer they didn't have air conditioning because funds were tight. My mother would twist her hair at the nape, secure it with one barrette, and walk around with a wet washcloth on her neck. If I aggravated her, she'd simply say, Michelle, it's hot. 
So we've learned about conflict, having interesting things happen. We're not going to write Evan's birthday party. We've learned how to structure our story, and we are on the way to discovering our voice. So what's my takeaway? What's my one core concept for you guys? Every person has a story to tell. It's how we connect as humans. It is important to share them, and you would be selfish jerks not to put them on your blog. <laughs> so what's your story? Questions? Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's starting your story way early, like the salmon were spawning over here, and then your, your story's about fishing. So you really don't want to start back there. Other questions? Yes? Sure. The question is, what if you are doing product reviews, and how can you incorporate some of these qualities of stories, such as conflict, into reviewing? What's something that you review? A dog bed. A dog bed. OK. So how would you do it now? Well, I don't currently have a blog. OK. <laughs> OK. Okay, so those are all the questions you're answering. Do they flatten easily? Are they washable? Do they support large dogs? I have a St. Bernard, so I totally understand this. There's stories to tell in there. I mean, you're going to test it on your dogs, right? So that's a story. You're going to try to shove it into your washing machine. That is a conflict. Does it work that way? Do you have to beat it with one of those old-fashioned beaters to try to get the stuff out? Are you constantly freezing it because you can't, you know, make it clean? So there are a lot of ways to enter into that. Just the process of you reviewing something is interesting because you are taking actions and learning and relaying what you've done. Yes. Mm -hmm. perspective. And what's been happening lately is I have a list of questions. We go through your list of questions, and while every person you meet, the stories all kind of sound the same. Mm -hmm. And it's an interview and not a story. So do you have any suggestions on how we can take the storytelling format and apply it to customer testimony? Sure. The question is about taking the storytelling format and applying it to customer testimonials. And in this case, the question asker, what's your name? Leslie is saying that they use an interview, like a questionnaire for them, and the stories or information tends to come out sounding the same. First of all, you might want to tweak your questionnaire a little bit, tailor it individually to the people that you're talking to about their experience, but that's what it should be about, is their experience of working with your company. And that's different for every person that comes through, and they will remember different things, and they will have had a different service performed for them. And you can create a story around what those unique things are. More questions? Um, yes. Hey, uh, Hi. The I don't think so. What was your traffic on the original post? It was very high. It was? OK. You might want to do something like, again, put the tab up there. Now I have this Portland tab. And you can break it down into categories that way. Um, you could also use it as a list builder, use that giant post, or you know, pa uh, chapterize it or something, okay. make a little ebook, sign up for your list, get this free thing, all this information about Portland in story form 
um, where you have an index of all the things you spoke about. It might be more accessible to people than trying to scroll through your, your 2,000 word post. Yes, yeah. yeah, she was my Portland example. She, I had lunch with her for like two minutes yesterday and now you're, now you're in my speech. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. The question is about you have, let's say, a client who wants you to detail everything that happened at a conference. This speaker spoke, they spoke about this, you know, we had the sponsor after party, this happened, whatever. Um, so you're a little bit client driven. What you need to do is kind of sell them on what's going to be more interesting. I think the biggest thing there is to tell them, let's do it a post at a time. It's better for them um, promotion-wise if they want to promote it later. They have all of this information that's going out at separate times to their list. You know, they've engaged in a dialogue for longer. Um, but also just to tell them that, you know, this really great thing happened. I think we should talk about this speaker's background and how she came to be speaking here. And that's more interesting. You've got a character development there. Why is she speaking on this? Why is she so passionate about it? But it is a, when you're do, working for a client, it is a sales job to get them to do this. Yes, in the back. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. Um, you spoke and you said that you gave us like the 29 minute version. Uh, so I guess one question is if you were to offer some resources, like, you know, where we go from here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, how did you prevent the dull um, schematic of, you know, like almost like making a case to do this step, mm -hmm. step one, step two, step three, step four? How did you bring that to life? Sure. Let me address the second part first, which is how to bring to life those tutorials. Think about Julia Child cooking. Like, it was hysterical, you know? She talked about all the things that were going on, and she dropped the bird, and all the things that happened. Or look at, um, there's a lot of cookbooks out there, I'm just using cooking for one thing, um, where they tell a story about the recipe. Where did you discover the recipe? You know, was it handed down to you? Um, where did you get the ingredients? Was there some kind of interaction there? Did you eat this first in a different country and you had to hunt down where you found it? There's lots of stories behind the food that we eat. Food is one of those cultural connections that goes deep, like story. The first part of what you said is, do I have more resources? And yes, I do. I do right here. Resources for writers. I'm going to pop these up into SlideShare. I'll tweet out the link. Um, I've got you an editing process thing here. Proofreading checklist. My favorite resources on writing. Number one here is On Writing by Stephen King. I have never read a Stephen King book because I don't like to be terrified. This is the best book on writing that I have ever read. And resources on grammar. Um, there's some elements of style. Every writer has to have it. And then there's two um, websites at the bottom that I particularly like. Grammar Girl is awesome. And then, yeah, that's all of them. So we, we have to go back to this picture of me because look at, I missed my, I had these long hair and I got it cut. I really kind of miss it. And also I was supposed to be wearing that necklace today. It's kind of my ne lucky necklace, but I forgot it at home. And I went to Target and shockingly the quality and selection of necklaces at Target is not that good. So <laughs> we can imagine that I got this long hair and I'm wearing that necklace. All right, other questions? <laughs> but I digress. Yes, in the back. <laughs> Right, right. I think one thing you can do is back to the customer testimonials. You can use their stories about working with you. 
Um, another thing when you're doing something like that, where it is a technical field and there is technical information to impart, is think more on the lines of your business as a brand that has a story. It's probably going to go more into um, an About Us page. You might have a CEO blog that's attached to it that tells stories, you know, features employees, features different projects that you're doing. So there's going to be the basic stuff in there of the how-tos, but surrounding that in the business, there's lots of stories to tell to brand yourself. Uh, what time am I at? Oh, we've got plenty of time. More questions? Yes. Voice, yes. Your voice is a snarky voice or you're reading snarky voice? Okay. <laughs> There's a place for that. <laughs> Well, I am an expert on snark, so I can tell you about that. You have to write who you are. If you're trying to write for what you think is popular, you won't be successful because it's, your readers are going to know right away that that's not you. Um, so write who you are and what you love and how you are as a person, and that's going to be genuine. And you're going to you have to trust that you will attract the people who want that. Not everybody likes snark. I know that's surprising but not everybody enjoys that kind of interaction and dialogue. It's very popular among a certain demographic, but there are so many other demographics out there who would love to hear your voice and your stories. Another thing I do with my students is have them read different you know, blog posts in different genres and then try to write in them and find which one is most comfortable for them. So that's another way to try to find your voice. Yes. I can't, I can't imagine. <laughs> the question is how do you blend writing, making yourself this trusted expert, but also you are a flawed individual. Um, yeah, that's kind of my shtick, really. Is that, you know, most of the things that I write about are things that have gone terribly awry in what I've attempted to do, but you learn from the end of it you know, what worked and what didn't work. So it's an interesting way to get to that story. The other thing is just being honest about it. You know, this is what my expertise is in. And a lot of inspirational stories from people are people who have struggled. You know, I got to this point because I struggled to get here. You know, and you can tell those stories about fallibility. And they are very, very empowering for you to write and inspiring for people to read. More questions? Yes. Okay, you're talking like affiliate links, affiliate sponsors to. No, I'm talking about sponsors. Give money to Oh, oh, okay. Well, that part of that goes with the deal that you make with them. Like, I would always be careful to make a deal where that you still can write independently. You know about how you feel that you don't feel hemmed in. Like, um, it's 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 a difficult line. Um, to try. You really, in your contract with them, need to kind of narrow down what their expectations are. Do they want you to mention the product so many times? Whatever. But hopefully you can still weave around, say you're getting sponsored to go to a conference, is that the kind of thing? Or sponsored on a trip? I'm sorry, I'm having a Writing, writing for Costco, but keeping your soul. 
that's how I would do that. That's more than like a, one, a, a sound bite that I can give. I have time for a couple more questions. Anybody? Are we? Yeah, it's in the green. Okay, I'm going to put the slideshow, the sli um, my slideshow up on SlideShare, and then I'm going to tweet it out with the WCATL hashtag, and um, y'all can follow it there and find it. Oh, I do. I'm not supposed to sell from the podium, but <laughs> if you <laughs> if you go to um, cindyreed.me, that is a landing page for my. I teach online, um, online classes on storytelling for bloggers. Yeah. Oh, you, you're being filmed. <laughs> we'll edit that out in post. <laughs> it's cindyreed.me, because it's like, you know, it's all about me. In fact, I think I tried to put Cindy Reed on this like 20 times, like, like the most egocentrical page. Thank you. Sure. All right, I think we're good. Thank you guys very much.